Welcome to Frost Sessions, the Frost School of Music's official podcast. On this week's episode, alumnus and music supervisor for Lego Movie, Insecure, and Entourage, Keir Lehman, shines a light on being a music supervisor in TV and film, music submission and rights, and the importance of balancing life and family. Thank you so much for joining us, and remember to stay tuned to Frost Sessions. Hello, I'm Keir Lehman, uh, class of 2003, University of Miami. Uh, Frost School of Music, um, and I'm uh, I'm now a music supervisor for film and TV, um, where I oversee the music um, for TV shows and movies, and put together soundtracks. Um, and uh, I've been doing that for about uh, almost 15 years now. Uh, I got started pretty quickly after I graduated, um, and I'm uh, happy to be here today talking with Jerry. Thank you, Tom Gerard Schwartz. And I'm only, this is only my second year here at Frost. It's hard to imagine. I feel like I've been here my whole life. Uh, I'm uh, a distinguished professor of conducting. I conduct the Frost Symphony Orchestra. And it's a joy for me to be here at Frost with such great colleagues, such great graduates, and to be with Shelley Berg, my dear friend, our dean. Uh, my background really was first as an instrumentalist. I played the trumpet in the New York Philharmonic. And then I became a conductor and I conducted uh, and continue to conduct all over the world. And, uh, uh, but my home now is here and I'm in Coral Gables actually, as we're speaking And here, you're in Los Angeles, I assume. That's right, yes, I'm in Los Angeles. So may I begin, because I'm very curious. Uh, uh, obviously I've, I've done my research, but <laughs> before doing my research, you know, we live in such uh, isolated worlds in a way. So my isolated world, my, the big world is classical music. The small world is orchestral classical music. And so even though to me, orchestral classical music is this huge world, it's a small world. And, and so then uh, reading about you, uh, before reading about you, and I apologize for this, I didn't even know what a music supervisor was. And, sure. and now I, I realize that you control the world. <laughs> <laughs> to educate me and, and hopefully people watching to tell us, because mm -hmm. you say, what do you go to school for? Well, I go to school to, I want to be a trumpet player, right? So I go to school to be or a conductor or a composer. But you don't, you go to school to be a music so I know you graduated in, in media writing and production. So in a sense, being a music supervisor obviously is, is the, the high point of uh, media writing and in film and in, in, in TV and so forth. But could you tell us? Yeah. I think, you know, uh, the, I, I, you know, and I wouldn't, I don't know that it's the high point <laughs> because I think, you know, the composer uh, are very important. You know, there's a lot of people that are, are I'm a part of the team and they're probably an important part of the team, but I'm, I'm a part of, of a music team um, and, and work with a lot of people um, to, to kind of help to help put together the music for, for a film. Um, so let's take a, a film, for example, and, and how I'm involved. So I, um, usually I would come in pretty early on the process and a director or a producer of a movie might hire me to work with them to put together the music for their film. And so um, I might help them find a composer to, to do the underscore. And so I would you know, pitch them ideas and we'll talk about you know, who would be right for this project and, and what their goals are. And then I will also start um, sending them uh, maybe ideas about songs. So they have, you know, film might, a script might have some songs written into the script or some moments where music plays. They may be, uh, sometimes it would be um, within a scene. So we may go to a club uh, and a bar and you would hear music in the background and people are talking. And so I help to figure out what's that song in the background gonna be? Um, sometimes you would have a, a montage maybe where a, a song is featured and you see uh, action kind of portrayed on the scene without sound and the song plays over that moment and kind of tells the story of what's going on. So I'll work with the director and the producer to figure out what is that song going to be? Um, and is it something that they maybe had in mind already? And I just need to help them get the rights to use it. I, I'm, in, I'm responsible for making sure we get clearances and get the, the actual rights to, to use the song in our film. Or they may have no idea what they want. And I have to help them figure out 
you know, okay, well, this is what's going on in the story. These are the characters. Maybe this is a genre of music that would be appropriate here. Let's find some songs that maybe speak lyrically to what's happening in the scene or in the film. And I start uh, pitching ideas to them of songs and we may go through, you know, hundred songs or a thousand songs really trying to find the right thing. Um, and I, uh, you know, work closely with the director kind of going back and forth and having a conversation about what their goals are, what they're looking for and, and what we can do uh, for them. Um, sometimes I have to deliver bad news that you can't afford this or the artist won't clear it for this project because uh, they don't like what it's connected to or associated with. Um, and so a lot of what I do is problem solving too. It's like, if, you know, they want something, but we can't have it. So what, how do we figure that out? And I help with alternatives and, and, you know, kind of walk them through like, okay, well, we can't have that, but here's what we can do. And, um, and, and then all the way to the end where we come with, a, we have all the songs in, everything's finished and I have to make sure we have all the rights signed off on and do a lot of paperwork and, and research for licensing and, um, kind of over oversee all of that. So there's a lot, uh, <laughs> there's a lot to do. And, and I work with, usually there'll be a music department at a studio and, and I work with the executives there who, you know, are overseeing all the movies that the studio is doing. Um, and so they may be, you know, working with a few different music supervisors on different films. Um, and so I work with them and then, you know, work with the composer and I work with a music editor who um, is the one who kind of works in Pro Tools and, and cuts the music in to fit the picture, works with the picture editor. Um, so these are some, you know, jobs that are maybe not the typical thing that you would first think of um, when you're thinking of, you know, working in music as a musician or in the music industry um, that are really, you know, still creative jobs and, you um, can you know be really fulfilling um, careers uh, you know with creativity and, and all of that. You know, it, 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 there are so many questions that come up, of course, in my <laughs> thinking about them. Now, you actually worked for Sony for a while, Sony Picture. So you were the the person who the music supervisor would go to. Uh, Correct. Sony for those years. So you yeah. Then you were Sony. Now you're independent once again. Correct. Yeah, I, I started. Um, my career working for an independent music supervisor um, as a, I started as an intern and then as an assistant and kind of worked my way up working with that person who was like a mentor to me. And then I left and, and was able to um, get this job at Sony Pictures where I was a, a, a music executive. So I would oversee some films where I would be uh, responsible for hiring a music supervisor and the composer and putting together, you know, overseeing the whole thing. But I was also kind of like an in-house music supervisor for some of the other films where my boss was the overseeing uh, executive. So like the president of the department would be overseeing the biggest movies. And so I would work with her sometimes on some of those movies as a music supervisor, pitching ideas and getting more in the trenches with the directors and stuff like that. So let, let, let me, I'm gonna, I have, as I said, a lot of questions to ask you because mm -hmm. I'm so curious, but if we go back to the beginning, what was your instrument? You must have been a pianist, a guitarist, a drummer. Or something. I, I, yeah, well, I started as a kid, I started playing guitar um, and played in bands and stuff when I was in high school. And then my, um, but I got really into uh, choir in, in high school. And I had an amazing music teacher at high school who was very, you know, supportive. And, um, and so he really, I think, you know, helped me feel confident that it's something that I could do. And, and I ended up applying to music school as a singer and auditioned and, uh, you know, went through that whole process. And, and one of the reasons that I went to the University of Miami was the uh, choir at the time. Um, the director was uh, Joe Michael Scheibe, um, who uh, was incredible, you know, is an incredible choir director. And, um, and he uh, took a liking to me and was really supportive of, of me and wanted me to join the, the group there. So, um, so I, I, I was a part of the chorale uh, there for all the years I was there and, and did tours and, and all that and had an amazing time as part of that group. And then I also uh, was part of the jazz vocal ensemble. Um, and, and I was, you know, I've always been interested in a lot of different music. And so for, for me, it was like, okay, you know, classical music and, and, and 
chorales and, and choir, singing in choir was something that I really liked, but I also liked jazz. I also liked pop music. I liked all these other things too. So that was one of the cool things about being in school there was I was able to kind of dip into all the different things that were available. And, um, and Dr. Scheibe also was the one who kind of helped guide me towards the media writing program because I had started as a music pro uh, engineering major. Uh, and I loved a lot of that, but I, it wasn't, it wasn't everything that I wanted. Yeah, yeah. Where did you actually grow up? In Florida? I grew up in Los Angeles. Oh, Los and Angeles. yeah, and I, I was just like a music fan and my father uh, is a record collector and I would always have a lot of different music around and he was into a lot of jazz and um, film scores, electronic music and um, I would look at records, you know, that we would play in the house and, you know, the musicians, a lot of the musicians that I became fans of were alumni of University of Miami. And that was how I kind of realized that that was a really great music school. And um, that's what led me there. Something that, you know, we pride ourselves on is that it's interesting. Uh, we all have a, have a dream. What do you want to do? What's your dream? So my dream, of course, was to play, play in the New York Philharmonic, which I actually got to do, but I may not have. And uh, so I studied composition. I studied, I studied everything. Uh, I played jazz. I was interested in everything, uh, even though I was able to achieve in, 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 in the early stages my, my dream. And the thing that I'm, I'm so impressed with with Frost is that, you know, there are so many avenues that we can find in creatively in the world of music. So you come in and you want to be a concert pianist and you end up being a recording engineer or you end up being a, right. or a music supervisor or, or an educator or, I mean, it just, the great thing about this school, I think more than any other school in the country is that you have the fluidity between departments. So people from all different backgrounds and all different desires can learn so much and actually end up being a part of this world rather than after you graduate, having to go into some other field because you can't. Right. You know. And it seems like that's very much the, uh, in your case, uh, because you develop then uh, uh, as, a, as a musician, yes. an intellect through the writing. Uh, did you ever write film scores yourself? I did only, I had not before, before UM, and I did there. Um, and also got to, you know, as part of the program, we scored a few scenes um, and had, you know, got to have the orchestra record them. And that was an incredible experience. And that, and that, that class was really uh, foundational for me in that it was an, ex it was probably my first experience of, you know, being in a room and presenting your music and, and, and having everybody critique it and, and, and be watching, you know, one scene with 15 different pieces of music put to it from each different person and discussing why each one worked or what didn't work about it. And, um, you know, it was something that I had kind of, that I was doing like for fun with my friends, we would put a movie on and put some other album on and just see what happened. Um, but then getting to be in that class and getting to actually do it um, and, and be in a group of people that could communicate and talk about it. I mean, that's basically what I do in my job now is, is put up music ideas to a scene. I put five ideas up to a scene in a room with a director and an editor and a producer. And we talk about what they like and why certain things are better than others. And, and it, it was really not only just for the actual uh you know, musical part of that job, but also just the idea of being in a room creative with creative people discussing something creative and having an opinion about it and being able to share your opinion and accept critiques from other people and understand, you know, how that communication feels. Do the, do the directors or producers come to you, like they come to you with a scene in a movie and they say, I, they, they give you a piece of music. That's the background for that scene whether it be a piece of classical music of people, pop music, whatever, and say, and obviously they're not gonna use, right? They're gonna have, mm -hmm. have a piece of Debussy as the background. Listen, mm -hmm. so they want something in that vein. And then 
your job is to find a composer to write something in that vein. Does that happen? That's right. That happens all the time. Um, that's a lot of, of my, a lot of my role because, you know, as they, let's say they shoot the movie and the editor, as they're shooting it, the editor is putting together the scenes that they're shooting, you know, kind of in the order of the script. He's just like assembling all the pieces together. And while he's doing that, he's going to add some music to help, you know, make the scene feel more real or, you know, highlight the emotion or, you know, how, whatever he needs, he's going to use some music and some sound effects and he's going to put it all together. And so uh, then, you know, once the director and producers kind of get more involved in the, in the cutting process after they finish shooting, then they're going to decide, oh yeah, this piece that you put in there, we don't like that. We need something else. Like what, where are right, key or Hey, we have this thing in there. We don't like it. We want something that does this or does this. Can you, can you help us? And so sometimes it would be finding a composer or a songwriter to write something original that will achieve what we're looking for. Or I may have to go look in existing music and find something existing that does what they're looking for. Um, and there's a lot of you know, different places that I might go to find, find that. So it seems like the easy part if there's such a thing in your job, there's probably no easy, mm -hmm. part. but the easier of the possibilities is if there's a film, it's a, it's a wonderful film, you know the script, you know the director, you know the producer, and you want to hire a uh, one of the great film composers. And as you know, I'm a great fan of film, you know, I'm a great fan of film music and boy, do we have great film composers. And we have a history of great film composers in Los Angeles, you know, from, from the third, sure. it's extraordinary. So in a way, that's so you hire the composer, you work with the composer and okay, that's fine. The harder thing it seems to me is what you do with so many of the TV series. I mean, mm -hmm. the ones maybe running now that a lot of people will know that I find very impressive is an insecure because right. it's, it's just full of music. And I must say really good music and really well done music, but Thank it's you. a real challenge to, could you give us a little bit of the background of that? I mean, from the beginning, because that series has got to be about four or five years old now. Uh, we're season four. We just finished. We're about to start season five. So yeah, that's Pretty about cool. right. <laughs> so so when, how did that, I mean, I, I remember reading some, uh, reading some that you actually read all the scripts and you were, right. and I think it was season four was starting and you were wondering where they're going to go with this and boom, it was something exciting and innovative and it made you, you know, your, your, your creative juices really uh, sure. run again. So tell us about the beginning of it and how, and how you were able to bring all these groups and in fact, give a platform for groups that, right. that had no platform. Basically. Yeah. I think, um, you know, it's something, it, you know, over, it, you know, over time, I've been doing this a little while I build up, you know, relationships with different place people. And um, I was really lucky early on to, to kind of, through my mentor work on a show with HBO. And, and over time I, I worked on that show for a while and got to know the people at HBO. And then after I'd been at Sony for a while and I left that and, and went back to independent supervision and I kept in touch with those people and um, they had this new show coming and they were excited about it and they thought that I'd be a good fit. And so I, I got to meet the creators of the show and the producers and, um, and they brought me in as part of a team, you know, that, that show, you know, we had uh, a few kind of people involved in the music and I get to work with, you know, amazing uh, composer, producer, Raphael Sadiq, who's just, you know, has an incredible catalog of music. And, um, and Solange Knowles was also involved in that early on um, as a consultant musically. And so I kind of came into the middle of it and, and helped kind of, you know, bring in all the ideas, bring, bring it together and kind of in a manageable way of like, okay, like all the ideas are really exciting, but we have a TV show, it's 30 minutes long, we have a budget, you know, it's this much money, and how are we going to be able to put all this music in the show that you want and have it work with our budget and work creatively and uh, address this kind of direction, I think, from, from Issa, the creator of, you know, we want to highlight independent artists we want to highlight female artists black artists and people from this specific location where the where the show takes place which is Inglewood and, and South LA mm -hmm. and 
So that was kind of like the conversation at the beginning of like, okay, this is our dream. This is what we would like to do. Like, how do we execute this? And so, you know, I, I would start, you know, my first step in that, in that um, process is I start gathering music. I start, you know, going through playlists that I've made before and pulling things together and, and doing research and reaching out to contacts and, and bringing together, you know, a kind of a little library for myself of like, music that could possibly work in the show. And then I start sending that to the creators and to the editors. And we start, you know, a little bit of a conversation of like, oh, do you like this? You don't like this? Let me give you some more of the things you like. And as we started feeding the editors and things, you know, started making their way into the episodes and, and um, you know, we kind of started establishing the sound and, and really, you know, trying to become a place of discovery. We wanted to expose people to new music. We wanted to give a platform to these independent artists um, that they wouldn't have. You know, radio doesn't play a lot of independent artists and, uh, and, and the music kind of uh, access to music is, is amazing and that there's access to a lot, but that also makes it hard to find things because there's just so much out there, how do you find the things that you like? And so, you know, one of the things that the TV shows have become known for is a place to discover music because they're curated in a specific way. So, you know, Insecure is curated to be like this modern R&B and hip hop independent artists. And, and then maybe there's another show that's curated to be, you know, singer songwriters and, um, you know, pop rock. Uh, artists and another show that's you know a different genre and and people have you know found that oh great now I I really love the show and I love the music let me go to this playlist of of this music from this show where I can discover all this great music that's in uh, a genre or a sound that I really like already and this is an easy way for me to get to find a bunch of this music so yeah. tv shows and, and especially insecure have become a really great place for people to discover music well, it's, you know, that's, of course, very interesting to me because, I mean, I grew up in a period where, uh, especially with, with uh, rock groups, they would, they would make, a, a, a C, make a, an LP and then it was a CD and then they would go on tour selling their CD. Uh, so they, the CD was made and then they go on tour singing or playing the songs from the CD to increase record uh, sales. And then, of course, the right. record would play those popular pieces and boy, careers were made like that. Now it seems to me like that that's, that doesn't work anymore. In fact, CDs uh, aren't as <laughs> right. popular. I, I mean, I, I have trouble finding people that own CD players anymore. Of course, that's going to change. I mean, you know, <laughs> it used to be you couldn't buy a car without a CD player, and now you have to request a CD player. Right. That. You can't find one. Yeah. That people must be beating your door down to try to get because here is a way to promote artists in an important way and really make their careers. So it must be. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> that is a big part of my email inbox <laughs> is full of people submitting music. Um, it's, it's just all day long. Uh, I used to, uh, I used to get bin like a mail bin of CDs like every day. Um, but now uh, people don't send things to CDs anymore. So we get links to download in our email and we get them all day long. Um, and so it's part of, you know, it's part of my job to kind of filter through that and weed through it. And, and of course, like, uh, you know, especially on a show where we want to foster independent artists and, and help build a platform, you know, I pay attention to a lot of those things that come in because I want to, of course, give people opportunities um, but I also, it, it's, you know, helps me because I get to find people and bring those things to my show. And um, so, but there, you know, we, we, we do get a submitted a lot of music and, and it's, I understand if I was an artist, I'd be doing the same thing. Um, and you never know. It's sometimes that's how things end up in the show. Sometimes, you know, they're, they, I reach out to artists to have them create things uh, for us. You know, I, I might think of an artist that would be really great for, a project and I reach out to them directly and ask them, Hey, you know, I'm working on this project. Is it something you'd be interested in? We have a little bit of money. I can pay you to, to create something. 
Um, and, you know, sometimes the artists would be really excited about that, um, of course. You know, I find that very interesting because I'm, I'm a great believer as you, in what you're just saying, because so many people, especially in your kind of position, so oh, I don't have time to listen to all of that. You know, just throw that in the garbage. Uh, <laughs> I, and I have two stories. One is, uh, of, uh, there was a man I, I knew who's no longer with us, who was very wealthy and he wanted to save the world. And he had a, he figured out how to save the world. And he was going to invest, you know, $100 million in saving the world. And so he said to me, you know, Bill Gates, right? I said, sure. He said, can you get me a 15 minute meeting with him? I will go anywhere, Seattle, we can meet in Washington, meet anywhere you want, I'll fly there. And I said, no, I probably couldn't do that, but I could probably get a meeting with his father. Uh, and so he said, great. So I, I see his father at the airport one day in Seattle. And I said, Bill, I, I told him the story. And I said, he wants 15 minutes. And Bill said to me, I have 15 minutes for anyone. And that's right, we do. He did, and he did meet with him. He didn't amount to anything. I had a manager once who's no longer with us, also Ron Wilford, one of the great managers of conductors uh, ever that lived. And, and he said the same thing. You know, I tell my staff that if a conductor says, you know, I want you to manage me, we have 15 minutes to talk to anyone. You know, it's hard to find people like that anymore. Everybody's too busy. I'm not too, and you're not too busy. And that's why we stay on top of the world to see what's going on. We try to keep our pulse there, especially you, because, because you are a pathfinder. You're, you're creating paths. Right. That's really quite, uh, quite extraordinary. And I commend you so much uh, for that. Thank so you. I mean, I try, I try. I can't promise to listen to everything, but I try as much as I can. And I have, you know, I have to be honest, I have staff that help me, that work with me, that get submissions to and help weed through it and bring things to me that they know are going to be good. And so, you know, it, that's it's part of the, the my kind of systems that I've developed, you know, to how, how am I going to get, how am I going to do the job to serve my producers, but also do the job to serve the music industry oh. and, you know, bring things to the table that are going to be right for my project. Well, you know, uh, you mentioned uh, in, in your introduction uh, that you get rights. You get rights. So, so there's a song you want. You try to get the rights. You get you go to the lyricist. You go to the composer and so forth. And I was reading about Sunflower, one of one of your great hits. Mm -hmm. And there were ten writers. Was that right? <laughs> how, did, how does one song have ten writers? Oh that, man! It's, do you get rights on a song with ten writers? I. Uh, it's something. It's definitely you know uh, a function of modern songwriting uh, that you know so many people get involved, and I think it's you know it's something where you know over time I think the the way that people there's a couple sides to it. You know, over time the way that people are listed and involved in songs changed because at one time there was a, per a producer, there was an arranger, there was a lyricist, there was a composer, you know, there's all these different roles that were involved, but an arranger wouldn't be listed as a writer. They would just be, you know, orchestrating the parts. Right. And nowadays the person who is doing the job of the arranger is considered a producer and a songwriter. Oh, I didn't know that. Yes, so, it's good so to be you know, <laughs> <laughs> yes, now that's a very important job. And so people who can be commanding, you know, a lot of money to do that uh, can also command to be a writer and to get a portion of publishing and to, you know, because, you know, people can see like when you have a hit song, there's a lot of money that comes out of that. And so why shouldn't somebody who created a part of that song, even though it's not the melody or the chords even, uh, but there's something about what they did that's essential to why that song is a hit, they should be compensated, you know? So that's part of why there's a lot of writers listed, but I think then it's also that it's collaboration is so easy and people can just send tracks back and forth, you know, over the internet and say, Oh, I know a guy who's really good at percussion. Let me send this to him. And then he does his part. Oh, great. I know a great guitar player. Let me send it to him. And that guitar player adds a part. And then those people, you know, become arrangers and get added into 
to the songwriting, uh, you know, list. And there, you know, I clear songs like that often. And sometimes you'll see people with 1% of a song or half a percent of a song. Um, but I still have to go get their approval and clearance and have them sign off on the rights of that 1% to be able to include it in a film or a, or a TV show. Wow, amazing. Now, I, you know, when I look back, a, a, a series that I also uh, uh, enjoyed of yours is Entourage. So Entourage is like the opposite of insecure. I mean, uh, I can't imagine, I mean, maybe there are more opposites but what is it like then for you, uh, you know, cause okay, people hire you and you mm -hmm. do a job for them. But in Entourage, you're doing kind of a, a job for these, uh, for these uh, inappropriate men. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Insecure, you're doing a, a job for uh, the progressive future of, uh, of especially black artists. And mm -hmm. so, I mean, is it because well, Entourage has gotta be what, how, 15 years ago or whatever it is? Something like that, yeah. Is it a question of when it happened or uh, uh, how much, how much, I mean, how much does it, does it affect you and what the actual storyline is? Or do you say, no, I'm not going to touch that because in our terms, they're all sexist, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I think, <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. And nowadays you probably wouldn't get a show like Entourage made um, about five white guys, um, <laughs> five rich white guys. Um, but, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly that too so um it's it's definitely something that i consider you know i <laughs> i'm a i'm a music fan and i of course have you know certain genres or certain artists that i'm personally a fan of you know more than others and um but in one of the things that i love about this job is that it's always it can always be different uh, from one project to another or from one day to another. One project might need <clears throat> two or three different genres of music in it. Um, or one project might be just focused on one genre and very, you know, on point with that. Um, and so for me, it keeps it interesting to, to work in a lot of different genres and some things I'm more familiar with than others. And sometimes I might have to do a little bit more research when I start a project or before I start a project to, um, you know, make sure that I'm aware of all the, you know, what, what's going on with that genre of music or whether it's a learning, you know, a catalog uh, from, you know, a long time ago or making sure I'm up to date on the newest things in, in that genre. Um, but that's one of the things about the job that's really more, most exciting and interesting to me is when I get to do research. I, I mean, that's, pretty much what I would be doing anyway, if I was just as what I used to do as a kid, just look at record sleeves and read all the names and who did this record? Oh, they produced this other artist. Let me go check that out, you know, all of that stuff. So that's, you know, fun for me. And that's uh, definitely, you know, the part of the job, one of the parts of the job that gets is exciting for me. So- <clears throat> yeah, Let me ask this, I, 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 I just thought of, I, you know, I'm thinking about, you know, being Mary Jane and some of the other shows that you've done, which are just so wonderful. But it, it, am I wrong to say that there's not as much jazz as one would think and that there's more pop music, more R&B, more, more rock, uh, and, and jazz isn't part of that grouping as much? It's not. I think, I'm, I mean, I feel fortunate that some of my shows do highlight jazz. Um, and one in particular is Black Lightning, actually. There's a character um in that show who's uh, there's a couple characters in that show who are usually listening to jazz um or we're playing it at home um but i mean in, in my experience there's not a lot of projects that feature jazz and i was actually on a panel recently with marcus miller who's a com film composer jazz bass player played with miles davis and you know just incredible musician and he you know was kind of talking about that that issue and and how you know, as a film composer and a jazz musician, he has had to, to kind of, you know, work on projects where you have to either, he, he was saying that like, it works best when the director, you know, makes the jazz music an important part of the piece that they're presenting. It's, it's a film or a documentary. And so the music, you know, has its own character or is its own character and, and has a place, you know, in, in the piece. And um, because he's had he's had a harder time usually 
using jazz music in the background because jazz is so improvisational. It's very kind of upfront and the music, you know, it's about performance and, um, and a lot of that can be distracting when you are trying to watch a character deliver a dialogue or a story. And when we're making films, that's the most important thing is the dialogue and the story most of the time, yeah. the, you know. You, do the uh, uh, and, and that's interesting because I find some, of course, some film uh, music is perfect background music, and when you take it out of the background, it's not as successful. Others are just right. others are just spectacular. Period. Because you sure. know, what I find is that you get a, a minute of incredible imagination, and and you know you can I mean you can steal from that all the time as a composer. You know, it's, it's cause yeah, because it is really quite. Uh, quite extraordinary. Um, so uh, I remember uh, reading something that you said about reading the script. So when you read scripts, are, are you, do you have input? Are you just imagining what music would fit best? Uh, what, what, uh, uh, or even do you read a script and say, do I want to get involved in this project at all? Yeah, sure. Um, I think it's, you know, I, I, sometimes I'll start a script without having much context. Um, and, uh, you know, just start kind of reading and seeing where it takes me. And I jot down notes as I go through and think about, oh, this, you know, oh, this character, this reminds me of this song or it reminds me of this artist or genre or something. And, um, and so I'm trying to, you know, maybe evaluate, is this something that feels the right fit for me? Um, or it's something where, you know, it's like a new project from somebody I work with a lot. And I, so I, I will want to be involved in it and I want to read the script to get, to get my bearings and understand where they are. And, and then, you know, usually the, you know, when I, I read a script, I'll go back and talk to the director or the writer, you know, they of course have their ideas of what they are conceiving when they're writing it, but they of course want to know my, my ideas and, yeah. um, you know, and sometimes we're on the same page and sometimes we're not, but I think, you know, being able to read a script without a lot of context, I appreciate because it lets me kind of develop my own ideas and, um, you know, without kind of preconceived notions about who wrote it or, or, or the actors or something like that. Um, so sometimes it's, you know, oh, what composer is gonna be really good for this? Who, you know, whose music comes to mind as I'm reading? Um, or it's like, oh, this is kind of more literal things where they're like in the script, they go to a concert or they, you know, go to a uh, dance club or a bar, you know, all these different locations that might have a certain sound to them that we need to, you know, define in the show and start, you know, talking about developing that as we, you know, that's something where then I would, we'd have a conversation like, oh, what's this club sound like? What kind of people are there? Um, I noticed they go there a few times in this in the script, you know, it's, it feels like an important location and they, you know, they tell me, oh, it's this, you know, this is the kind of clientele, it's, you know, and, and you know, then we talk about, okay, great, let me give you a bunch of music that's going to, you can try in that, in that moment. Um, and uh, so usually after I'm done reading a the script, there'll be a bunch of ears, dog ears, and then at the end, like a big bunch of scratch notes of like different artists names and stuff. You know, in, in, the, in the classical music world, of course, we, we all want stars. Uh, we want stars because stars help sell tickets. If you have a star, uh, you have Itzhak Perlman, let's say, is a great, great violinist and he's a star. He's on the concert. The concert's going to sell out, uh, which is great, which means you can do a lot of interesting things on that program because Itzhak's playing, you know. Right. So when he started out, of course, he got a very good manager. Uh, he had a good publicist. He had a good recording company behind him. He had, uh, he had a little exposure because he was on Ed Sullivan as a kid. So he had a little television. I mean, he had all, everything ready. I mean, it's no, nothing's easy, but it was, it was moving forward in a positive way. And you can look at just about every important classical artist uh, up until, you know, 10, 15 years ago. And that's what they did. There were exceptions. Van Cliburn, great pianist, won a Tchaikovsky competition in Moscow. Uh, and the late, and that catapulted him to. Then he got the publicist and the record company and label, so, right? Yeah. yeah. And, and nowadays, it's we're not creating as many stars as we used to, and the stars are the same stars that were there, you know, twenty five years ago. And in the jazz world, I find that to be a little bit the same. 
you, you know, you talk about the great star, you know, uh, let's, let's say Wynton Marsalis, the great star was the last of the great star. I mean, it's not true, of course, but uh, he was part of sure. the end of that period. And uh, so how does one, whether it's in pop music or not, if they're on your TV show, that's different. That's, 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 a, new, that's a new way. You could do that with a, with a great pianist. You could have sure. a great Yuja Wang on, uh, on, on, the, on your program. And of course, she's gotten to be a star now. But it would, it would catapult her to a different kind of thing. But what, are we, what does one do anymore in any of these fields to, to, to make yourself special, to make people notice you? Uh, it, it seems to me like it's, it's a difficult time. Not to say that there's not a lot of activity. There's a sure. huge, wonderful activity. Right. But how do you rise above Correct. a lot of, of, of you know, good things, basically, <laughs> to be great? And uh, it's, it's, I think it's, it's hard right now because not only just with music, there's so much music coming out and there's so much access to it and it's being, you know, every day there's more and more but just with media in general, like there's just so much going on that how do you cut through and, and get a, a piece of people's time and attention? Um, and, you know, I think I'm, I'm, as far as jazz, you know, I'm thinking of Kamasi Washington, who's probably the biggest current, you know, young jazz star. And, um, you know, what, you know, he kind of didn't really... I mean, obviously he came out of a jazz community, but his fan base grew into other areas because of, I think, because of associations with other artists that kind of helped lift him up and helped bring him along. And whether it was established, you know, other established jazz artists or hip hop artists who would have him on as, a, as an artist featured on their album, um, you know, that he was able to build a following that kind of brought in also a lot of people who weren't necessarily jazz fans specifically. And I think that that's, you know, I think that that, you know, that's something that is, I, I'm sure many people would like to follow uh, in, in that in that model and that foot in those footsteps. Um, you know, and obviously the music is incredible and, and, and everything, you know, involved in, in putting everything together is very meticulous and the artwork is amazing. And, you know, it's like the whole package is, um, is there. And he has a team behind him, of course, helping to build that and, and a community of musicians in Los Angeles that, you know, support him and, and gone behind him. So, you know, I think uh, there's something to learn from that. Um, but it's, I thought, it's I thought not they, easy. They should be knocking on the door and say, please, please, let, let me be on entourage. <laughs> right. Yeah. You know, and I've, I've been, uh, you know, I've been fortunate to work on projects that are open to those kind of, of artists and, um, you know, people that, that have great taste too. I mean, you know, I, I, part of, part of, you know, my job is to bring taste, but also I work, I get to work with people who have great taste. And so, you know, I, I don't make the decisions in the end, the, the director or the producer, you know, is the one who makes the choice at the end. Um, and, you know, I, I'm fortunate when I get to work with somebody who also has great taste. So they, they, you know, appreciate what I'm giving to them and they make the great selections or they may push me in a direction, you know, that is part of their concept that brings everything together. So um, yeah. that's you know, a part to, of it too. I've listened to a lot, of, uh, a lot of songs that you were instrumental in getting started and I like them all. Uh, and that's from a, a hard, hard nosed classical musician. I appreciate that very much coming well, from you. I, I remember there was a, a Baroque composer named Frescobaldi and he wrote a big treatise on ornamentation Right? how you ornament this and what are the rules and at the end he said after all is said and done have good musical taste and that'll be fine <laughs> really the key to it uh, my, my last question is uh, of course you've done a lot of films uh, even though we, we focused a lot on, on TV shows um, which do you prefer what, what do you find different what, what's more gratifying uh, it's hmm. got harder to do half hour TV shows than it is to do a film, it would seem to me. Uh, they both have the challenges, you know, I think the thing with TV is it's on a much tighter, usually much tighter time schedule. So 
um, when I started, I was working on a lot of TV shows um, on CBS. And, you know, we would finish an episode almost every week and it would air three days after we finished mixing it. Wow. So the turnaround and then, you know, so by the time it airs, we're on to the next one and we're almost done with that. And then it's like a machine and they're just like going, going, going. And there's a train and it's not stopping. So when you are, when we're pitching music, we want to make sure it's things that we can get the rights to in time to have it done by when we deliver this episode. And if, if we're not going to, we have to replace it really quickly and find something else. So that's, it's a, it's a challenge, but it's also uh, something I appreciate because I get to use a lot of music because I'm working, you know, every week I'm putting five more songs in a TV show. And so I'm working with a lot of artists and, co you know, publishing companies and record labels. And so I'm, I'm you know, very active and I'm always in talking to people. And so relationships come out of that and you're spending money. And so people want to come back and they want, you know, so I appreciate that about working on TV and also, you know, especially recently, like there's so much great TV shows and a lot of stories that might have been independent films or a low budget film are becoming, you know, eight episode TV. So, you know, there's a lot of really great stories being told on, on TV right now. So, uh, you know, I, it's something where I, I definitely appreciate like being connected to that side of it but uh, on a film you know and, and this is maybe a change a little bit but I think that there was a time where tv was a little bit more disposable in that you know a tv show would air and then it, it wouldn't you wouldn't see it again necessarily unless it went in reruns or syndication or something um whereas a film is maybe made more to last and stand the test of time and so you have more time for it. You know, we might spend a year or more working on a film and developing songs over that time um, and writing original, you have more time to create original songs um, and to, you know, f focus on details and, and, you know, maybe things that would be more difficult or time consuming, we can, we can do that on a film. Um, and so there's a less day in, day out pressure to have a song cleared, have all the songs cleared, send options for something needs to be replaced. There's, there's a kind of less of that. Um, but there's, I think, maybe a little bit more pressure to deliver something that's going to be great and, and, you know, stand the test of time and, um, and, and, and you know, create this great, a great film. So I, I appreciate both. And sometimes I think, oh, I think I'm just... I'm done with this TV. Like it's too stressful every week having to clear all these songs. I just want to work on movies, you know, but then I wouldn't have a show like Insecure. I wouldn't have a project like um, Becoming, you know, there's, there's things that, you know, are, uh, you know, projects that I'm really uh, proud to be a part of and, uh, you know, love working on and are very rewarding. Yeah. Now, with all of the work you do, and it sounds like <laughs> pretty darn busy, you do have children too, don't you? I do, yes. Family is important. How many children do you have? I have two children. I have a 15-year-old daughter and a three-year-old son. Wow, congratulations. Isn't that <laughs> Thank you. It's, uh, I was definitely, I'm very proud of that. Family is, as you say, really important to all of us. Yeah. yeah. Here, this has been just a great joy to talk to you. I, I, I can't wait till we can spend time together here at the Frost School in Miami or when I'm out in Los Angeles. I look forward to that. And, uh, and this is our f the end of our Frost session. And we're so grateful to the School of Music for, I'm so grateful for putting us together. Thank you so much. It was really a pleasure to talk to you. And uh, I, I look forward to you know visiting Frost someday when we can <laughs> and, uh, and shaking your hand. <laughs> This is, I can't say you have to come here for the weather because LA has nice weather too. <laughs> I know, but I miss, I miss uh, the weather there and never having to wear pants or a jacket. Um, and I haven't been, it's been a little while. So I know the campus is even more beautiful now and, and some nice new buildings there. And it's full of interesting things now with tents everywhere. I mean, they've done such an incredible job. Uh, t taking care of us so that we can have in-person in in classes and no one's getting sick. So we're well, pretty, that's great. pretty darn lucky. 
Yeah. yeah, wonderful. Great to talk to you. All the best. You too. Thank you. Until the next time. Thank you. Bye. Bye.